This lesson is the introduction to energy. What we're going to talk about today is energy, work, and power, and how do we calculate kinetic energy and potential energy. First off, energy is a measure of a system's ability to do something useful. Okay, we should be aware that energy exists in, exists in many different forms. Uh, you may have heard the terms kinetic energy and potential energy, but you should definitely be familiar with the fact that heat and light and sound and nuclear and chemical, these are all different forms of energy. You should also understand at this point that total energy is always conserved. It only transforms from one type to another. And we will be looking at some of that transformation from one type to another. First off, the units of energy are joules. Uh, joules are named after James Joule, uh, a Scottish physicist who studied heat and was key in the law of uh, discovering the law of conservation of energy. One joule corresponds to one newton times one meter. Uh, and to compare it to something that we're a little bit more familiar with, one joule corresponds to 0.239 calories. You should be aware, though, that the calories listed on our food labels are actually kilocalories, so they're really a thousand calories. Power is another unit that we're going to be looking at. Power is defined as the rate that energy is converted from one form to another. Uh, it's basically how much energy do I use in a certain amount of time, or work over time, or even energy over time. So I suppose I could rewrite this as energy whoops, over time as well. Okay, and the units of power are named after James Watt, another Scottish physicist, and he had significant improvements to the steam engine, which in turn led to our industrial revolution. Uh, one watt corresponds to one joule per second or one newton meter per second. So kinetic energy is a measure is a type of energy associated with an object that is in motion. I call this the useful energy because things have to move before something useful actually happens. Uh, if things just sit there, that's not useful. Okay, things must move. The formula for kinetic energy is given as one half the mass of the object times the square of the velocity. So the faster something moves, the more energy it has. Okay. Frequently, we're going to be looking at the change in the object's kinetic energy. We would do that with the same formula we do all of our deltas. So the change in my kinetic energy is going to be final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. Potential energy, however, is stored energy that can be converted. Okay, uh, In general, it would be converted into kinetic energy. Three types of potential energy that we will be looking at are first off gravitational potential energy. This is the energy stored on in an object based on that object's position in a gravitational field. If I the higher it is, the more gravitational potential energy it has. Elastic potential is the energy stored in a spring, and electrical potential energy is uh, stored energy based on an object's position in an electric field. I'm only introducing this here. We're not going to really talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about electric potential energy in a coming unit. So for there to be potential energy, there must be some force that is preventing the object or object from moving. For instance, if I lift an object up, my hand is preventing that object from falling. If I remove my hand, okay, that potential energy gets quickly converted into kinetic energy. The force of gravity accelerates it down, making it go faster and faster. So let's look at gravitational potential energy. Okay, close to the Earth, we are aware that the gravitational field is uniform and has a constant magnitude of 9.8 newtons per meter, or uh, we're also familiar with it as 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, and to, for us to calculate gravitational potential energy, we must define an arbitrary ground level. Frequently, that's going to be the lowest point in the picture, but it's perfectly okay to have a negative gravitational potential energy, have a negative value for energy. It simply means that you are lower than the ground level. Okay, the formula that we're going to be using for gravitational potential energy is given on the bottom here. It's the mass of the object times that g 9.8. So if we were on a different planet, I would have a different g. 
um, times the delta H. How much, how high, or how, what's the difference between the object um, and its ground level? Okay. So, for example, I have a five kilogram block which is lowered from a high shelf, which is two and a half meters above the floor, to a lower shelf half a meter above the floor. How much gravitational potential energy did the block originally have, and how much did it lose in moving to the lower shelf? Well, calculating it, I basically just plug it into my, the first part, I just plug it into my mg delta h. Notice I don't give you a, a ground level, so I might as well use the floor, um, and uh, because that's the lowest point in my diagram. So in this case, my mass is five kilograms, G is 9.8, and my shelf is two and a half meters above the floor. So if I multiply that out, I get 122.5 joules. In terms of my, uh, how much energy did I lose moving to the lower shelf? I can just do Mg delta H, okay, because M and G don't change. So I'm 0.5 minus 2.5, and so I lost um, negative, uh, 98 joules. The ne negative indicates that I lost it. Um, I need to include it on this diagram because I forgot the minus in the PowerPoint. So <clears throat> I could have used a different level. I could have used the sh lower shelf, okay, but then I would have had to recalculate the fact that my high shelf for the first part, how much gravitational potential energy did the block originally have? It would have been only two meters above and then I would have lost all of that 98, lowering it to that lower shelf. Um, so the easiest thing to do is just use the floor as your ground level, the lowest point in the diagram. As you get more uh, familiar with these types of problems, you can arbitrarily change that lower point to potentially make the problem a little bit simpler. Elastic potential energy is energy stored in springs and rubber bands. Okay, you pull a rubber band back, you let it go, the rubber band goes flying. Uh, slingshots, catapults, these are examples of things that have elastic potential energy. I know we haven't talked about it much, but springs operate under a law that's called Hooke's Law. That says the force of the spring is given as K times how much the spring or rubber band is stretched, delta X. Okay, frequently you will see this as F is equal to minus K delta X. All that means is that the direction of force is opposite the direction of displacement. For example, if I take a rubber band and stretch it, okay, the rubber band wants to pull this hand back towards um, the center, but I pulled it the other way. That's all the minus sign in there means. And the formula that we have for elastic potential energy then is going to be given as one half K, where K is the spring constant, how strong the spring is. If I change the spring, I get a different K. Okay, so elastic potential energy then is going to be given as one half K delta X squared. Okay, thank you.